Hello again. Now we know a bit more about the climate, I will present a brief history of climate design, in particular bioclimatic design and its basic principles. And this starts in prehistoric times, when our far ancestors in the northern hemisphere sought shelter in caves, partly for safety, partly because these were more comfortable than staying outdoors in the harsh cold of winter or in the simmering heat of summer. A cave is relatively stable in temperature, hovering around the annual mean temperature. Therefore, it's not strange that humans started making cave dwellings in climates that could have big differences between summer and winter, day and night, such as deserts, or in climates with a benign average temperature, such as here in southwestern France. In somewhat colder climates, without caves, humans started building homes with massive, heavy materials for stability and thatched roofs to keep out the cold and rain. Here you see an ancient house in Denmark. It had small windows, one door and a smoke hole in the roof. In windy areas, buildings often responded to the predominant wind directions, as you can see here. And in rainy and snowy regions, roofs had to be constructed in such a way that homes didn't leak and that the water could run off easily. Overhangs were often created to provide shelter for rain and snow, but also to protect the constructions underneath. This was particularly important with timber structures. Good detailing enables centuries-long usage of wood. Extreme protective measures against precipitations are nowadays found by complete umbrella structures, as you can see here. A different challenge with water is moist in the form of humidity. Loam or adobe has been a building material for ages, for typical wattle and daub or half-timbered buildings as shown here. Less known is that loam can regulate humidity. If a space has a high relative humidity, loam will absorb water vapor from the air. If the air is relatively dry, the material will release moist from the material to the air, of course within limits. It makes loam suited for indoor stucco plasterwork. This brings me to the aspect of mass in a building. You may imagine that if a cave is preserving its temperature year-round because of the enormous mass around the hole, buildings with a lot of mass will also stabilize the temperature indoors. You can notice this in old churches and mosques, where the heavy stone structure tempers differences between summer and winter. Nonetheless, in colder climates, even mass will not create a comfortable temperature. Therefore, additional heating is needed. In medieval buildings, this heat was provided by hearths inside the building, oftentimes a kitchen, around which the other spaces were organized. A first example of compartmentalization or spatial zoning, you could say. In farms, thermal insulation was sometimes provided by a buffer zone of stables with cattle and by a hay storage in the attic. In this manner, multiple functions were combined when our modern day insulation did not exist yet. It lasted until the 18th century before central heating systems were first used in rich people's homes. But did you know that the Romans, way before that time, had already invented central heating? In fact, an underfloor heating system? The so-called hippocaustum was used in Roman bathhouses. Hot water from a stove was running through ceramic pipes in the wall and under the floors. Life in Roman times was so much more comfortable than in the centuries afterwards. Another piece of Roman mastery was construction. They invented concrete and made immense structures such as this dome in, of the Pantheon in Rome. I am however showing this because of the climate aspect of daylight. The so-called oculus, or eye, in the roof catches so much light from the sky that the immense building is always illuminated sufficiently during daytime. An equally large window in the wall would have never established that. The higher the window, the more daylight it catches. This principle was explored to the max during the Gothic construction period after the 12th century. This here is the Cathedral of Bayeux in France, where high windows as large as a facade of a house bring daylight into the otherwise dark church interior. In modern times, due to the easy production of glass, buildings have become ever more transparent. Already in 1923, a building with a complete glass facade had been constructed in Heerle, the Netherlands. The post tower in Bonn, which, is, which even has glass floors, perhaps is the most extreme example. For fresh air and in order to cool the interior, this office is ventilated through the facades. And this brings me to the aspect of ventilation. 
because no building is inhabitable without proper air refreshment. This can be established with mechanical means, but also in a passive way. With wind coming from one direction, there is always a facade with overpressure and one with underpressure. If the temperature is not too low, windows or grills can be opened to create an air current through the building. As we have seen, this is done to the extreme in topo tropical climates. Ventilation can also be wind driven indirectly. Here you see a building in Melbourne, Australia, where wind drives a fan on the roof, which creates an underpressure in the building, sucking out exhaust air. Next to thermal stacking, this is one of the passive solutions that can induce ventilation. With our sometimes complicated buildings, or when we want to recover heat or moist from exhaust air, natural ventilation will not be an option. Mechanical ventilation and air conditioning therefore has become the norm. Sometimes, however, it is getting out of control. If you attach so many air conditioners to your building, you may be able to create a comfortable indoor climate, but you will heat up the neighborhood, creating a vicious circle of requiring ever more mechanical cooling in summertime. And your demand for energy will increase significantly. Therefore, we want to teach you smart bioclimatic design. The term consists of bioclimatic design, coined by Ken Yang as the passive, low energy approach that makes use of the ambient energies of the climate of the locality to create conditions of comfort for the users of the building. A second term is smart design, which by modern sources is seen as design that interacts intelligently with the environment. And that brings us to the combined concept, smart bioclimatic design. A design approach that deploys local characteristics intelligently into the sustainable design of buildings and urban plans. So, hereafter we will work by the method of smart bioclimatic design, which will be exemplified by our next case study, the Pret Alloger House. Please have a look and then I will see you again with the next lesson.